Well, welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Boyce and the host of Inside Personal Growth. And joining us from Bend, Oregon are Helen Edwards, obviously on the left, and on the right, Dave Edwards. And they have a new book out that I'm going to hold up, you guys, called Make Better Decisions. Look, he's holding it up too. Um, how to improve your decision making in the digital age. I think it's really how to improve our decision making and our critical thinking skills as well, because um, I'm not certain for many people if those haven't gone in the toilet <laughs> because they're using the digital age to help them make decisions. And um, I don't always think that's the best thing to do. So, and you outline this in the book, not that you said that's the worst thing to do, but the reality is, is that uh, we're going to be speaking with them about that today. And I want to let our listeners know uh, something about both of you. Helen and Dave are serial entrepreneurs. They own Saunders Studios, a company focused on helping humans succeed in the digital age, and is their fifth company. And in 2017, they sold their artificial intelligence market firm, Intelligenesta. Is that correct? Did Intelligentsia, I say right? yes. And Atlantic Media and continued their work at Atlantic Media Subsidiary Courts. As you can tell, they're a husband and wife team. They have the same last name. <laughs> and they've worked together since 2009, saying that they wouldn't have it any other way. Well, I'm glad as a couple, you guys get along and you can work together. My wife tried working with me, but that didn't work out. So <laughs> she's, <laughs> done her, she's done her own thing. But again, we'll have a link to Amazon to the book. Uh, we'll also have a link to their website, and it's Get Sonder, S-O-N-D-E-R, just GetSonder.com. There you can learn more about their training programs. You can learn more about them. You can learn more about this book. Um, you can see what it is that they do. So with that being said, <clears throat> you know, you both speak about why you wrote the book, and it's always a great place to start. I always say, hey, why do people write books anyway, right? Um, Please tell our listeners about the aha moments you had when working with one of your clients and how that guided you to kind of write and make the, write this book and put it out. Well, thanks. Um, we love aha moments, you know, that moment of where the, the non-obvious becomes obvious. And I think when it came to decision-making, which we'd thought and talked about a lot because, um, you know, I'm a, fan of Danny Kahneman and all of his work on decision making. Um, the one of the things I noticed in our clients is there were a few people that would do things like print off a list of cognitive biases and pop them on the wall next to their desk as though knowledge of the fact that we have these biases in our thinking was enough to become this sort of perfect rational decision maker. And I became really intrigued about why people thought that they could just sort of um, print these things off and have them there and then they'd, they'd make better decisions. And I started to think, well, maybe there's a better way of doing it. And I think the real aha moment was combining that with the way that uh, in the modern workplace people use, uh, expected to um, sort of get insights from data without necessarily having to sit down and really think about it, that the data will just give them an answer. And the aha moment was like, well, none of that's going to work. You actually have to improve your own decision-making and that it's more like meditation, you know, a, a practice. It's more like sport. You go out and you, you, you spend time actually practicing things. And then over time you get better. It's not something that you can go to a checklist for. And so that's why we wrote the book is to, um, cause we started using the 50 nudges ourselves and, um, they actually work. So over the course of a year or so with our clients and with us, we saw that it worked. People were making better decisions as they got to practice certain techniques. Well, you know, you talk about decision-making and, and, uh, I don't know if I said this to you before, but I interviewed a Harvard professor and she's blind. And she wrote a book, and I can't remember the name of the book. You guys might. Um, I needed to look back into the archives. And it was about, it. you know, she studied in grocery stores. You know, if there were six peanut butters, 
right? <clears throat> and a man or woman went down the aisle. Six was too many, right? It was like it it stopped your ability to make a decision about the creamy peanut butter or this peanut butter or that peanut butter. But they found the optimum number after all of this research, obviously her being at, I think it was either Harvard or MIT, it was like three. So the less, dis, the less options, the quicker we could make some decisions, right? And it's kind of the same in business. You guys have probably heard this. You run workshops. You know, <clears throat> I remember this from Larry Wilson, of Wilson Learning. And it was so imperative. You know, the little lights would go on. You'd play a game between two teams and you'd try to get across. And it was like whack-a-mole. The key was not to look at all the dots and say, oh, well, that's the one that went on. Now we need to take this path to get the other side to turn the light off so we win. It was really to step on the landmines as quickly as possible because that's how you found out what didn't work, right? Those, those decision-making processes. But many people were frozen because they'd see the lights and they just sit and freeze, right? So I think that's a, that's a tough place to be in. Dave, can you speak with us about how big data and small data leads us to making decisions and how our intuitions are data-driven as well as the influence uh, that this has both good and not so good on making decisions, including the ever complex and changing world in which we're living? Because it's, you know, this is an ever dynamic. It's always moving, right? You go to make a decision, something changes. People today, certainly out there listening to this, can get that. You know, it's like, look at our economy. They just raised the rates 0.75%, right? You're going to make a decision. Are you going to sell a stock? Are you going to buy a stock? What are you banking in it? What are you basing it on? And I think people are a bit frozen right now. They're like deer in headlights because there is so much going on externally um, and uncertainty. So I want you to comment about the uncertainty too. Sure. Uh I think that there's a lot of things that people get trapped um, conflating. You know, we talk about things like um, the idea that you have to separate rational decisions from emotional decisions, or in the context of your question, you have to separate data from intuition. When actually everything is data, if you think about it, our intuitions are informed by all of our own individual experiences, which essentially is the data that we have lived. The data that exists in the world, whether it's small data about an individual transaction through to big data about everything a company knows about all of their all of their employees and all of their customers, those are the sum of the individual experiences of humans. And it gets sort of you get sort of stuck in this idea that just be there, that data must have the answer. Right. It, 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 there's so much of it. And we've invested so much money in creating these huge data platforms. So the data, the, the answer must just be there. Right. But it actually isn't because in the end, data is just data. And we are the, we, it requires humans to make sense of that, to make humans to provide context, to understand what that data actually means to us, to an individual or to, in aggregate to a society, and then figure out how to tell a story with that data that motivates other people to act. And so you get lost in this idea that we just have to look at a chart or a graph and therefore there's a decision and you get frozen when you look at it and you're not sure what to do with it because you're not allowing for the fact that you actually have to be a human and actually look at it and interpret it and make some, and make some decisions out of it. So we include a bunch of nudges in the book about how to think about how to use data and how to, how to think about it, how to um, do things like um, look at what the uh, look at what understand who the humans are in the data. It's one of my favorites. It comes from our friend Jevin West, who's a professor at um, University of Washington. Um, and you know, looking at data to understand that there are actually humans in that data. So who are they? Uh, let's think about that because when you think about who those humans are, that'll probably help you understand what to do with it. Or looking at data and understanding what the finding the gaps in the data. Who isn't in the data? What experiences are not in the data? When you were telling your story about the Harvard or MIT prof walking through the store and and she was blind, that's a that's a classic example of the kind of people who can frequently be forgotten and left out of data. We mm -hmm. think about the people who walk sighted through a store, and frequently the you know you could you can easily have data that is not including those people who are not sighted who can't see the peanut butter. 
And so you're not sure what to do with those decisions. So it, we, what we try to do is actually resolve that sort of human question and that human paralysis by thinking that data is superior in some way. And that helps us bring some of that sort of that fear and the paralysis and that complexity back to something that we can actually get our hands around. Yeah, so so true. You know, I know in your world, the digital world, um, you know, they say radical curiosity is really important. And you speak about curiosity in the book, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at any, and, and I wrote a book on intuition, uh, the reality is, is that, you know, you, you look at quotes out on the internet from Steve Jobs, and he says one of the most important things he used was his intuition, right? Trying, he was radically curious, but he also used his intuition. Bill Gates, the same thing, has plenty of quotes out on the internet on intuition. And I think that people have a tendency to not realize that all these data set points that we've gathered over our life to put the dots together, as Rita McGrath would say, right? Can you see around corners? Can you see what's coming? Is the train going to hit you head on, right? Uh, to be able to make better decisions. And then at times as humans, many times, uh, we can see uh, irrational behaviors, lots of irrational behaviors. Uh, and then speaking about that, Helen, you list 10 of the biggest decision-making errors in data-driven world. Could you share with the listeners these 10 biggest decision-making errors and what we can do to avoid them? Also address the fact that all decisions are emotional, as you guys say. You know, even if you think, okay, I'm going to let the AI do the work for me, right? Okay. Yeah. And that's probably the best example of that is the stock market. You know, these traders have these machines that gather all this data and then it triggers certain points and they do that. But I would say much of what happens in the market is emotional driven by the data that's coming in on a daily basis. It's how somebody feels right? That, that they're making a decision. So what are those 10? Well, it was, I'll just go back before I answer the 10. I'm just going to go back to the, the, uh, the peanut butter example. And yeah. um, you said that, that, that this, that you're given six or nine or whatever. I, and the original study was quite a, quite a few. And that three was this magic number. And there's no accident in that. And it's something that we talk about a lot in our workshops is um, humans thinking one, two, three, lots and lots and lots. You know, we can hold one, two, three in our minds really easily, those three dimensions. And then we get to lots and lots and lots. So we have um, 10 uh, main reasons that we, you know, 10 biggest decision-making errors. But if I say all 10, you probably only listen to the first three. So I'll give you the first, <laughs> the things that were the ones that I think are the, the kind of the, the Buy the book important. if you want the other seven. Yeah, buy, yeah. buy the book buy the, for the other book. seven. And for those of you who aren't distracted by the idea of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich <laughs> now, then you're hungry. Yeah, yeah no, I'm not. But, um, <laughs> this, so the very first one is overusing intuition. Mm. Now, I, I'm going to declare my bias is I'm a, I'm a big intuitive decision maker. It doesn't mean I can't use data. It doesn't mean I don't want to use data, but it means that I want my data to be intuitive to me. So um, it takes me time to really sit down and, and sort of understand what the data says. And, it's, and, and to me, I would never make a decision off the basis of quick look at the data. I think that's a terrible way to make a decision. I need to actually understand the meaning in the data. But overusing intuition is um, a, a very bad decision-making error. And the reason we do it is because that's kind of how we evolved. Um, it's very energy efficient and humans, it, it, all of life evolves to be incredibly energy efficient and humans are unbelievably energy efficient, you know, 20 watts to run our brains. It's just sort of nothing. And um, so overusing intuition is, is, is kind of almost a, a natural way of making decisions. It's very fast. It's very efficient. And it's usually good enough, as I think Danny Kahneman's quote. Um, but it does depend on fast, accurate feedback and being in the right context, not getting out over your skis. You've got to be in an applicable environment. And that's um, increasingly less possible and more dangerous in a data-driven world because we don't have an intuition for what's in these vast data sets, um, especially when the data is collected um, beyond our, our, our conscious um, 
awareness. So eye tracking and mouse clicks and things like that, that are proxies for behavior and proxies for emotion. So overusing intuition in the um, algorithmic age is, is, is problematic. Um, the overconfidence is an enormous problem. Um, it's, it has been called the mother of all biases. And um, specifically over precision, which is an excessive sense that we know the answer that we're right and that we know the truth. And when we're over, uh, when we're, when we overuse intuition, um, we can uh, over, over precision is made even worse because we get this fluency in our decision-making, you know, that feeling of, of just having this fluency and I'm right, I need to do this, you go that, and you get the sense of certainty and the sense of um, just making good judgments. And that itself feels good. There's an emotional signal that is called judgment completion, and it makes us feel good, and uh, which makes it feel right. But just because it feels good doesn't mean it's right. That causes us to jump to conclusions. And we do that all the time. Uh, Kahneman says humans are machines for jumping to conclusions. And so we become very conscious of you know, better decision making can become uh, just even an awareness of when you're jumping it to a conclusion. And I think that the other big sort of category uh, is is that we don't recognize inherent emotion and we don't, and we try and um, we try and and either overrule our emotions in an unsatisfactory way, like we pretend they're not there, or we pretend that things are going to be different in the future. There's a lot of deep scholarship around how difficult it is to forecast our emotions into the future, but they do suffer from predictable biases. So we we can know, we can anticipate things better if we um, have some um, what we might call cognitive crutches from um, simulations about the future and AI has got a lot to um, to give us in that artificial intelligence can can really help us do that but this idea that decisions um, us that thinking is separate from feeling uh, is something that uh, the economists gave us um, because they shape the baseline measure of human decision making and that that modern neuroscience is really calling that into question and we see it all the time. We see that um, people make decisions emotionally all the time. I think Antonio Damasio has has said many times, feelings come first. Um, they that is a, that um, being able to understand and engage your emotions and your intuition can guide you to the right place in the problem space, so that logical reasoning can then take over. So that's sort of how. We think about that broad category of decision making. How do you um, become more uh, aware of overusing your intuition and your confidence? And how do you calibrate that correctly for the situation you're in? And how do you use your emotions in the in the right kind of way? Mm -hmm. um, how do you get to that sweet spot in um, your in emotional and how you actually feel? And how do you um, engage that slower more logical reasoning when you need to um, particularly when faced with ambiguous data when people don't when you don't know what the data says you're going to revert to intuition straight away and we see that all the time we give people problems that are designed to be ambiguous and the very first thing they do is say what their gut feel is every single time and so the nudges are really designed to sort of have multiple ways to attack this problem of of how do you kind of i don't know deal with the rubik's cube if you like of decision making yeah it's interesting how you put that and and again for my listeners there's 10 of them so get the book <laughs> so that you can get the other seven. Um, the other thing, you know, there used to be this saying in business. I'm not going to say personal because look, when you, you're dating somebody, whether you're a man or a woman, and you're trying to make a decision, are you going to marry that person? Uh, that's very emotional, right? Uh, it's, it's predicated on how you're feeling and how you're, how you're acting. But there used to be a, a, a statement, and I'm sure the two of you have heard this, um, 
the only wrong decision is no decision, right? And so in other words, if you just keep hanging out, I've, I've questioned that myself as to whether or not that statement is even valid today. But you will still hear that in business. Um, because sometimes, to me, it seems like no decision was what you chose to do, right? It was whatever gut feeling you had. So you said, hey, I'm not going to make that decision right now. I'm not going down that path. And I think that's the part I talk about kind of with freezing. Because we're we, in a programming world, you know, you guys have to like build software that says, if it does this, then this, if it does this, then this, this, because you're constantly having it make decisions until it finally, <laughs> it finally gives you what you want. But Dave, in your chapter on make good decisions, you state that decision making takes practice. And that's what you guys just said earlier. Um, because many of the techniques that work best, especially the data, require overriding natural and often pleasurable cognitive processes, what Helen was speaking about. You have 50 decision nudges that you reference. What are some of them and how will they help us in making better decisions? Because there's a lot of them. Yes, there are there are there are fifty. So I clearly won't be able to list them all and yeah. have you all remember them. They're organized into five but, categories. But they're organized into five categories where we talk about decision creativity and flexibility, reasoning, decision tactics, and decision self awareness. And there's ten nudges in each of those. But I like sort of your setup question around thinking about no decision. Um, uh, the only bad decision is no decision, right? That that right. sort of idea, and. Part of that's based on this concept that you feel better when you've made a decision. You feel better when you, you're confident that you've done something. It feels good to use your intuition because you feel like you're right. And we have this hero worship in our society of the people who have succeeded and are deciders and they make good decisions and they're, you know, that sort of top down kind of thing. And, and especially in the world, which now is sort of dominated by this founder led tech companies, those people get lionized as the people who are constantly making decisions. And so we got to make a decision. Don't say, don't, don't, don't not make a decision. Some of that is what we, we get at when your question around how do we override those natural, you know, and often pleasurable cognitive processes, right? So we, uh, one of the core nudges, I think, would be to delay intuition. This uh, is inspired by Danny Kahneman. I'll just take a moment to say that all of our nudges are inspired by people who are great thinkers. We call them the great minds. And so each of these has a rooting in uh, an academic field or a practitioner who we're really inspired by. Uh, and so when we ref reference those, that's where they come in. And when you read through each of the nudges at the bottom, it says who they're inspired by. And we have great references to go dig deeper into any of these topics. Um, but Danny Kahneman talks a lot about intuition and, and the power and how good it feels to form that intuition. And the most important thing, and in some ways the most challenging thing, is to delay your intuition. One of the techniques we talk about, we use in our workshops, is to work people through to understand what your intuition is. And then to research things that are the anti-intuition, to work against your intuition, and then to research reasons that support your intuition, and then then go back and real and think about what decision you want to make. So, are you able to actually delay settling in and, and bonding with that intuitive response to try and push against yourself a little bit? What it does is it helps you not jump to the conclusion, right, and have that pleasurable experience, but it also helps you inform your intuition. If you can actually practice updating your intuition, another in nudge we talk about is using, we talk about updating your intuition and, and keeping a, a, an intuition journal where you're learning where your intuition's really strong and where you might want to improve, but delaying helps you work through that. Another key nudge that I bring up is um, calibrating confidence. We talk a what lot about- would, What would you say about, you know, when I did research for my book on intuition and talked to programmers all over and professors and people that- taught programming i found a lot of them denied the outside themselves let's just say that the spiritual element of intuition you know it's like well i've had all these experiences and i took all these experiences and put the dots together well there's always that final step where you didn't have all the dots 
and an aha moment occurred, just like we said earlier, for you to be able to kind of pull all those pieces together, right? And I found it interesting how many people would, they would, they didn't want to go down that path. They didn't want to talk about the fact that there might be something beyond them that sparked them. You know, I, I do a show and it includes spirituality. So signs and symbols is another one that we've talked to many people about that get signs and symbols and they act on it, right? They really do. They're like, hey, I got a, I, I saw a bird fly across and that to me meant something. And I was going to go, that, that said to me, I'm going to go take this action, the sign or symbol. Where do you guys land in on that space? Um, it, it sounds, I know, a little weird, but it's really not. But I'd love to hear where you guys are on that. Oh, we talk about lots of things mm -hmm. that you'd think are really weird. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's just <laughs> yeah, we, we're kind of weird. It, we mm -hmm. talk about lots of stuff like that. Now, there's a couple of different ways to to sort of approach the answering that question. First of all, I think the the big overarching part of this is that understanding how our causal reasoning does, uh, d uh, defines a lot of of the way that we um, process information from the world and where we look for reasons. We are, our, we are causal reasoners, which means that we tend to see causes for any effect, and we're motivated to see causes for any effect. So, um, it, whether it's um, whether it's someone has a feeling about something or has a a, 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 um, a mental model that's come from their spirituality, no matter what it is, or whether they're um, thinking um, in in, in, a, in a pattern recognition kind of way, one of the top nudges that we advocate is alternative causes. And whatever you're thinking about, whatever you think the reason might be, because we, um, when we reason forward into the future from causes to effects, we we're prone to a particular error, which is to not see alternative causes. So we want to have we want to sit at the effect, look back at the causes, and think about multiple alternative causes. And so I think that um, that's a, a powerful tool that's very inclusive, because what it does is, and we all have so many different associations in our brains, right? We're completely unique individuals. So whenever we, if we can agree on an effect and we can discuss what that effect is, and then we can, re, we can respect that all of us have different causal associations and different patterns in our own minds, different life experiences about what that possible, what those possible causes can be, we end up with a much richer, inclusive discussion. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that works across everything that works. That is the core of diversity. When we talk about diversity is having different life experiences, being able to have um, those causal discussions, whether it's um, because you, you, you grew up in a different country, you're, you have a different spirituality than the person sitting next to you. Um, whether you, um, whatever the reason that is a very potent way of sort of having much more sort of deep respect for for the associations that people bring and an aha moment that moment of creativity that is um that is a neurologically distinct signal in our brains and that's that and we have that moment of the the obvious the non-obvious becomes obvious right and we we need that diversity and um, we need that variability in our own thinking and in the thinking of the team. So we work quite hard to um, bring inclusivity into decision making based on 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 how we think causally. Yeah, I, I think it's important to remember we have these big, beautiful, powerful brains. But one of the reasons that they're so powerful is we're able to collaborate with others. So we use the knowledge of others that are near us and that work with us. Plus, we also put our knowledge out in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's a sort of a, 
can be a counterintuitive idea. You think, well, to make a good decision, I need to put myself in my office and sit in front of my desk and not have any distractions and everything else. We actually go quite different, think quite differently about that than, than you might you know, think from that concept. So we talk about being less brain bound. How do you think about getting out of your brain and tapping knowledge that's out in the world? How do you get outside? How do you move? We, you know, tapping into work from Barbara Tversky and A. Murphy Paul about the fact that so much of our knowledge is out in the world. And that makes sense when you think about it. There's only so much knowledge we can have in our, in our body, in our brains, and so much of our knowledge comes through our body. We think um, metacognitively a bit, and we can think with interoception that helps us understand, you know, the inside workings of our bodies actually tells us a lot about how we feel today and how we might feel after a decision. And we can evaluate it that way. Yeah, that's we, kind of our, some of our and wackier we, stuff. And we talk definitely a bit of the wackiest. So we also talk a lot about flow. Flow is one of the nudges. How do you get into that state of flow? And I think right. for someone who is highly spiritual, allowing yourself to be in that state, to actually have that flow state that comes through being bonded with your spirituality will put you in a good space for making decisions. And that's an individual experience. How much does that matter to you or to you or to me? That's all our own individual spaces and that's fine. But being in that good emotional spot, whatever that means to you is going to improve your decision-making. Well, that, and that's the real, that's the, the how to get to an aha moment. Yeah. Um, being, being able to be in that, that cognitive and emotional space where it's essentially almost a deep relaxation. Hmm. And that's where you can reconceptualize something that you might've been battling with for. Oh, most certainly. You know, it's, yeah. um, if you, if you look at it, whether you meditate or you do yoga or you go for a walk in the woods or whatever techniques you're using um, to get yourself out because you're trying to solve a problem, you know, that's the best space. I mean, I mean, um, Stephen Kotler has been on here. He's been on here six times, he's been on here 10 times and, you know, the flow genome project is about hacking flow. Now, I don't really get that we're all going to be able to hack flow. Okay. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to be able to hack flow. I'm going to be able to do these things. There are certain things that are going to help you definitely and get in the right space. Um, and, you know, when you, when you look at extreme athletes and the things that they do to get into that flow state to be able to sustain whether it's riding a wave Hamilton or somebody else, you know, who's doing something. It's interesting when they study the mind, uh, the chemicals that are being released, the endorphins that are being released, the things that are happening, that's what we're trying to get to. And I think whatever techniques we're using, yes, you can hack it a bit, but in the end um, it's, it's still, I don't even know how to say this. Maybe, it's got to come naturally. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, Helen, you mentioned that you have borrowed techniques from the design thinking called five whys. And I'm sure my listeners understand what whys are. Um, if we keep asking ourselves why, 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 we're going to finally get down to it uh, in this decision-making process. Why is why so important? Why is important because um, the power of explanations, essentially. And so I think about it as, I mean, I'm an engineer originally. So, and this came out of, you know, the five whys originally had its heritage in root cause analysis. And it's very easy to, like jumping to conclusions, it's very easy to take the first answer and not, not really press um, but what happens with explanations, uh, that explanations are generative and you actually create something in your own mind when you, when you offer an explanation, it's not, we're not like machines where we just go in and retrieve something from memory. We sample from this probability distribution, if you like, in our minds. And we don't really, I mean, I don't know where the, I mean, the five was sort of I think people get tired after six, uh, <laughs> after five, and probably in root cause, cause analysis, there's a law of diminishing returns, and that's sort of a, a, a nice place to stop. But we can't really get 
we don't have access to every single intuitive layer of our explanations. It's just that the, 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 our beliefs are formed very deeply. But by asking why a number of times, what ends up happening is that you have to generate an explanation every time. And when you generate an explanation, it changes the way that you process the information. And the real guru on this is a, a prof from Princeton named Tanya Lombroso. And she's a genius at understanding uh, the way that that uh, explanations cause us to to do more than just reason. They cause us to uh, really have to construct something in our own minds. So, and this was something that I I really embraced deeply when I was doing the research for this book, is truly understanding how powerful it is to have somebody else offer an explanation as well. And um, this is an absolute slam dunk for anyone raising teenage girls. It's just <laughs> like the, the ultimate thing to do with teenage girls is to gently coax explanations out of them because they're the ultimate people who think they've got the world utterly dialed. And um, if you even just one layer of the explanation and you see the complete realization in their own mind that they've got no idea why they think what they think they've it's come to them from someone else mm -hmm. it's come to them from social media or what have you and when you press them for an explanation it's that it's so revealing to just see them go uh i don't know so as a mom of three <laughs> teenage girls it's an absolute slam dunk but it works and it comes to um we sort of come at this also from Steve Sloman, who wrote a book called The Knowledge Illusion, which was really almost sort of where we started this journey is picking up his book, which is where we, we get our knowledge from our community. And um, there's a, uh, a, a, a psychological effect called the, um, the illusion of explanatory depth. And we feel we know more than we do because we have access through friends, family, the internet, whatever it is, to information and knowledge. And when we're forced to explain something, we realize how we don't know as much as we thought. And it busts this illusion. We use this all the time in our workshops. It's a very, very powerful way of, of it's very humbling to realize that what you that, that you your sense of knowledge isn't actually backed up by knowledge. It's backed up by access to knowledge. Right, right, I agree. Yeah, and yeah, and it's it's a very profound insight. Thus the reason for going out in the world, because that's where you're going to obtain that. And I love what it said. I used to do a, a workshop with my a son who's in the software industry business. And um, I came up with the title, Never, Minding, Never Mind the Noise, Thriving in a World of Ever-Increasing Complexity. And I think that complexity is a key issue here and the noise is a key issue because when you can find the signal in the noise, right? Um, it's like the beacon that's coming through. That's where you're getting kind of your aha moments. Um, and Dave, you mentioned that making creative decisions means understanding the problem, applying patterns and elsewhere in meaningful ways and allowing time and space for imagination. You just mentioned that. And um Somebody asked me the other day, I don't remember how it came up, but um, um, Imagineering and Disney, I actually met Walt Disney when I was six years old. I got to actually shake his hand and say hi to him. And the lady was so like, oh my God, you got to meet Walt Disney. Well, imagination is a key. What are the nudges that help us unleash the most creative decision-making? Because there's so many people in this world that we've seen are just hyper-creative right? And you always wonder why, what space are they in um, that they have this magic gift to be so super creative, right? Um, versus, you know, a lot of people where it doesn't come that easily. We, we love the creative uh, nudges. And there's, that's one of the core sections of the book is on decision creativity. Um, there's a few that I'd highlight here. Um, a lot of it has to do with being in the right, um, the right Im Im mental and emotional space in order to allow the creativity to happen. We talked a lot about, uh, about aha moments and being more curious. 
Um, but I'd highlight a couple. One is to wallow in the problem. And this comes from our good friend, Michael Bungay-Stanier. Um, and he brings a design mindset to, to the concept, which is to stay in the problem as long as possible. You know, it mm -hmm. feels so good to get to the solution right. that it, and you feel like you're the hero in the room when you're the one who comes up with the idea. But the problem with that is you're automatically cutting off any ability to be truly creative. Mm -hmm. True creatives stay in the problem as long as possible. So you spend 10 times as much time in the problem, understanding it, than you do in actually generating and creating the solution. And in our world as human-centered designers, which is another part portion of our business, we spend a lot of time understanding the problem. So much so that our clients go, wow, we're really spending a lot of time in this, aren't we? But that's where the creative ideas come from is when you really sit there. Um, another good nudge that I'd highlight, one of my favorites is sketch. And this um, was inspired by Barbara Tversky, who wrote a wonderful book called Mind in Motion about how we, how we think through movement and how spatial reasoning is the foundation of abstract thought, which kind of gets you to that sort of concept of creativity, right? And she did a lot of work um, in her career around about with designers and creativity and found that sketching was a really wonderful technique for advancing creativity. You don't have to be good with a pen. I'm actually a terrible sketcher. I mean, no one would be able to under really tell what I'm actually drawing, but sketching something out, uh, sketching out what you think the problem is, sketching out what you think um, someone's emotional state is, thinking, sketching out who you think you're solving this for. Whatever you're doing, you're generating something and the action of actually using a pen on paper or a pencil on something or a marker on a whiteboard gives you a new way of thinking and seeing what you're thinking. For me, that's quite powerful. I'm one of these sort of classic extroverts where I, I, I don't know what I'm thinking until I say it, which is a, 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 must be a real wonderful, charming um, challenge for my wife and business partner, because I'll sit there and yammer on and then I'll go, nah, I'm not sure I really like how that sounds. Let me change that. I'm going to change that idea. Idea. But sketching does the same thing. I can draw it out and go, mm, I'm not sure I really like that. I'm going to go back and think about that one again. If I really understood this problem, I would really come up with some sort of creative idea. Are you an I think auditory I'm, thinker? Uh, I definitely think out loud for sure. Yeah. So um, you're an auditory yeah. thinker. Yep. Yeah. Very much yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. much so. And and I think and I think quite generatively and experimentally out loud. Um, so understanding what that is, is, is important and allowing, as you say, that the time and space for imagination, right? right. Not, uh, not rushing it. I think it's also important to share um, uh, uncertain ideas and allowing them to be out in the world in a way that they, they're not complete. You know, you, you mentioned Steve Jobs and one of the, you know, one of the perhaps less famous parts of his creative process was one walking. So it's constantly out wandering around infinite loop campus back in the day. And also the way he introduced new ideas, um, he would walk in and say, this might be a dopey idea, but right. And offering something up that was not complete, that was still messy, that was still possibility that someone else could contribute ideas to it. And it was one of the great ways, I think Johnny, I've talked a lot about how that was the way they'd start their most creative con you know, conversations is he opened up the idea to allow someone else to bring new ideas to it and contribute to it. Well, so I think like Michael, like Michael, like uh, Michael yeah. said to wallow, you know, when he, when you guys were talking about that, and I think that's a great nudge, probably one of the yeah. better ones, because yes. it's not to the fastest that come to the solution, uh, because you really haven't thought it out. And I actually looked for this quote while we were talking about it online. And Einstein said, a man should look for what is not for what he thinks should be. Great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. I believe in intuition and inspirations. I sometimes feel that I am right. <laughs> so, sometimes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Sometimes. Right. Um, Helen, in your book, you mentioned that life throws us curveballs. Boy, does it. Uh, but that we crave certainty. And we do. You know, we're in uncertain times. People are looking for certainty. If there was like a big solution today, it would be, how would you help provide the world with some certainty? And we try to create certainty in our decisions. We're talking about decision-making, thinking, okay, I'm making the right decision by doing this. How do I do that? 
what must our decision making, why must the decision making be flexible? And what are some of the nudges that you'd recommend applying when uncertainty is present, which right now seems like almost all the time? Yeah, yeah, you're right. We don't, we do crave certainty. I mean, our brain interprets uncertainty as danger. So we we tend to, you know, we don't like uncertainty. Um, and, but we have to, there's a couple of things we need to do. One is to actually somewhat reframe our relationship with uncertainty. Um, it's, you think about what it's like to, to you know, watch a, a basketball game and the sides are completely unequal and you know who's going to win. So it's not really interesting. I mean, the most exciting games are when it's back and forth and it's really close. And that's uncertainty as fun. It's uncertainty as opportunity. And that's really what uncertainty represents. And I think that there's a little bit of an intersection going on here um, culturally uh, with the analytics movement, with the promise of the analytics movement. And the promise of the analytics movement and AI in general is that there's the single optimizable answer and that a human can't possibly find it. We need a machine to find it. And I think that that's exacerbated this sort of um, focus on reducing uncertainty to zero, just the predictive world we live in where we need predictions for everything because we've got predictions for everything. And uh, we need to actually really remember, especially leaders really need to remember that um, uncertainty is opportunity and that the job of a leader is to actually help their people get better at managing uncertainty because it is difficult. It's uncomfortable. And there's, you know, paradoxical decisions, there's dilemmas. That's just the way life is. And um, some of it is that we've got more of them present, more of them presented to us every day. And a lot of the nudges that I like about flexible decisions and the reason we need flexible decisions is because uh, we can't quantify the uncertainty. There is no machine that can tell us the optimal answer. The answers to life, the universe, and everything is 42. Well, it's not. And <laughs> so we, we, we need to be flexible because we could be wrong. You know, we we'd, um, we work a lot in um, complex problem solving and in translating some of the new science of from from complexity science across into business. And one of the great insights is you've got to reframe how you deal with uncertainty. And one of the ways that I personally do it, that's been a really big help to me um, when life throws curveballs is one that comes from Adam Grant. Um, and the nudges be less wrong. And uh, instead of trying to like get your the things you know to be just a little bit better, just a little bit better, focus on the things you don't know. And you can get a greater lift on just a little bit more understanding of the things you don't know. And that's not an intuitive thing for people to do because guess what? It's uncomfortable. It doesn't feel good to go and wallow in the things you don't know. You want to wallow in the things you do know. That's why we have... That's why we all read exactly the same articles over and over and over again, you know, just different variations of our favorite subjects and go down the YouTube rabbit holes and what have you is because we tend to like to read things that are familiar. But once we start to research things that are less familiar, that are less comfortable, um, and that we're able to handle the uncertainty around that, we start to see more opportunity. We start to have that close baseball game, basketball game. But that that's a that, well, that's it's so to sort of get used to. It's so easy to fall into reading things, Helen and Dave, that we'll, we're familiar with or we like. Uh, I remember when I had Stephen on the show not so long ago, I said, you know, look, if if you're a programmer, you might want to read uh, Architectural Digest. You might want to read all of these things that are so foreign to you in different spaces that you're not in, because that's actually going to stimulate you, you know, your ability to come back with better decisions, better creative decisions, better ways to approach something. Um, and he was telling me all the various publications he reads that are unrelated to anything that he's doing, uh, right? And I always remember that because I thought kind of odd, you know, the first thing we're going to default to is another book about something we know in a space that we know because we feel comfortable and familiar with it. 
And it's going to reaffirm what we already thought because somebody's going to say something that we'd already heard. And we go, great. Okay. I can hang my hat on that one again because here's somebody else who wrote a book that said that that's good. So that's got to be right. And I find it fascinating that our default mechanism is, as you say, toward those biases. Those are certainly huge biases, and that's where we're going to go. Um, and as humans, you know, I'm not a social biologist, but we have a tendency, as you said, to move towards the things you said, we're only using 20 watts to power this brain. So we're moving toward things that are comfortable and don't take a lot of stress. And we kind of go to homeostasis, right? It's like, okay, great. This is, we can hang out here, right? Um, but the it, it's not how you're going to grow. You're certainly not going to grow by doing that. And, you know, you guys in the book, you give, it's a great guide for individuals and teams wanting to make better decisions, right? Let's face it. I'm going to tell all my listeners, they didn't give you all the nudges. So go buy the book so you can get the nudges uh, because they are great. And their citations from the people they came from. It's awesome that that is worth the book just in itself. Even if you only apply one of those nudges, what three pieces of advice would you like to leave our listeners with uh, associated with making better decisions. If you took this whole book and wrapped a ribbon around it and said, okay, guys, you're going to leave this podcast today. And here's three things, just like I said before, not 10, not 12, three that you guys can walk away with. Uh, it's like the peanut butter jars. Do we want creamy or Jeff or do we want, do we want to get almond butter? Okay. You get your choice. <laughs> For me, uh, the, one of the top ones is um, decision self-awareness, is to have this um, holistic sense in your own self about um, what decision-making means to you and how and why you want to get better and to embrace who you are personally. Um, if you're an intuitive decision-maker and the world tells you that intuition is out of fashion, well, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to um, uh, to just sort of reject that or are you going to find ways to make data and analytics work for you? Um, and I, I love this idea of, um, I love the word metacognition, which means thinking about thinking. And it's a human skill, deep human skill. And we have a whole section devoted to improving your metacognition around decision-making. And in the last few years, I think that's the one thing that I've personally embraced the most is allowing myself to um, accept the kind of decision making decision maker that I am, but to find ways to be a better decision maker uh, on things that just don't come naturally to me. Mm -hmm. And so being more and the power of explanations that that's the one that's really stuck with me and getting asking myself for an explanation, <laughs> writing it down myself and discovering that I have deeper reasons for things than, than I thought at the outset. I just think it's really, and being, it's a, so much better, so much better equipped to, it's like, like what they say on the airplane, you know, put on your own face, put on your own oxygen mask first. So you get better yourself and then you, you can help other people make better decisions. Yeah. I'm going to add one. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I've got one, which is um, uh, to accept that decision-making is a practice. It's not a process. So getting better at decision-making is not frequently. We'll have people who come to our workshops and say uh, they want a three-step process, four-step process. They could even be a nine-step process. They just think it's a stepping, a stepping process. If I just follow this process, I'll make a better decision. Decision-making is way too more, is way too complex for that. So you have to allow for the fact that it's actually about practice. So embracing this like you would meditation or be improving your ability to play the piano or being able to shoot a basketball better. It's not a step-by-step, -step, it's actually practice and learning and thinking. And so once you take that, that's why we wrote a book that has 50 nudges. There may be one of them that matters you today. And we recommend that people just take one to focus on right now. Maybe pick one a week. You know, you've got one that'll go through an entire year and after a year, you'll be, you'll be much better at it. But once you embrace that, that this is about repetition and practice and you allow for that to happen, that'll improve your decisions. 
And I'll give one, I'll give the third. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. The third one I think is to allow yourself to be vulnerable and ask for help from others. So much of one of the nudges we talk about is about having knowledge in the community, about getting the outside view, about wallowing in the problem with others. There's a lot of things that's actually not just about yourself. And we have evolved as a species. We've specialized. And one of the things that allowed us to specialize and not have the same brain all the time is that we work together as a community. We've developed rituals that allow us to come together, right? We have stories that bond us together as, as people. And so allowing that to be part of your decision-making process, right? You've got wonderful people around you that have different perspectives, that have diversity of decision-making skills and abilities. And looking at that as a team and focusing on how do we as a team help make better decisions as a group and also help each other make better decisions as individuals. I think it's quite powerful. And I say that because we do this all the time. You know, we, we actually have done this. We've run this. We've worked together for more than a decade building businesses and writing a book together, which as you said at the beginning, many people will find to be an unusual circumstance. But one of the things that happens is that we actually embrace the fact that we think about things quite differently. We're very different kinds of decision makers and we allow ourselves to be vulnerable to get help from each other about how to improve our own decision making. That's a very powerful combination if you can make it work. Well, I think you come from the perspectives. I'm going to say perspectives. You, you know, obviously there's a the sexual biases, there's the marriage kind of bias, there's the business biases, but you really have wrapped it up in an excellent book about people to make better decisions. Um, they, they didn't say always the correct decision, they said better. Um, and, I, and I think that's what's important is you know, you said you get these, uh, I'm going to say adrenaline kind of rushes or endorphin rushes as a result of us uh, finishing the loop about a decision. In other words, hey, I made a decision and it turned out good. And that keeps me wanting to make more decisions. Um, and I want the to emphasize that the wallow one um, that's Michael's is really important because I think today in the Western world, we've been put into a position where it's like, how quickly can you make that decision? You know, hurry up, make a decision. You know, your boss or the CEO or whatever is saying, I want a decision. I need it by tomorrow. Right. And then if you go back to him and you tell him, well, I don't have all the data points. I don't have what I need. I don't feel really comfortable doing this. He says, no, but I need a decision. Right. So you know, sometimes people are forced to make a decision against all odds, against the things that they're doing, right? And I think that's got to be one of the toughest ones, is that not having a control or feeling like you're out of control with relation to that. But I will tell everybody listening, in that position, give this book to the CEO and tell him, hey, I'm just really trying to help the company make better decisions. <laughs> so, <laughs> I well, I think you speak a deep truth there. Yes, I, you do. I, you know, it, we're re we're rewarded for having the solution rather yeah. than the problem. Yeah. And uh, and and Michael, I think we say in the book, Michael uh, had tapped into some research. That I think it's like eighty percent of the the work in organizations is solving the wrong problem, so making the wrong decisions. Yeah. And I think a lot of efficiency can be gained by just slowing down and wallowing a bit longer. Yeah. And I think you you hit it. It's really slowing down, and it's important. I think. I want to say this because so much of this personal growth space is about letting go. Hmm. You know, we get these thoughts and it, you don't have to believe everything you think, right? But because you think it, you're like, you live in the world of uh, MSU making stuff up so that that thought then becomes the, I, th then becomes the belief and the belief becomes the knowing and it's your truth. And now you're headed down that path all of a sudden without actually doing some critical thinking about what you just said. Hey, let's think about our thinking metacognition. Did, how did I really make that decision? And I don't think too many people other than the two of you probably are doing that, right? I really don't. I think that it's such a natural process that we fall into that we really don't give ourselves time to 
critically stop, take a look, and question how we've made the decision. You know, mm-hmm. so I want to thank both of you for being on the show. I want to thank you for bringing to light something that I think everybody needs to know more about and that they should take time to do. And I I think it's a blessing. So thank you both for being on Inside Personal Growth, spending some time with my listeners, talking about making better decisions. We'll certainly put a link for those of you who are interested, go to uh, getsonder.com. We'll put a link to that as well. Thank you both. Namaste. Thank you very much.